the founders of uh, L'Avion Jaune, which is uh, the sister company of Yellowscan, uh, doing surveys and uh, uh, tailor-made uh, instruments. L'Avion Jaune, we made uh, last year in the window uh, a quite interesting survey uh, using uh, the Yellowscan mapper on uh, remainders from uh, World War I. So I will present that uh, in the uh, absence of Daniel Hubet, who uh, should have come, but he, he couldn't come for some administrative reasons. So um, he's the, clearly the principal investigator on that. Uh, I will try to, to give as much information as I, I can about that, but uh, I'm not in the core of this, of this subject. So why surveying uh, World War I uh, battlefields? Uh, there are several reasons. Uh, one is that uh, it's uh, of inter historical interest. Uh, now it's the century of uh, World War I, and there are many uh, commemoration, many uh, new uh, publication books uh, uh, published about that. And uh, we don't uh, know everything about how it happened, uh, because uh, it was often a, a huge mess. And so uh, the traces uh, we can find today help to reconstruct uh, battles or uh, other actions during the war. Another thing is security. Um, actually, it's, uh, it sounds hard to believe, but uh, uh, there are there have been many, many uh, unexploded uh, shells uh, during World War I. Uh, I put the figure that uh, you had 856 million shells fired in Europe during four years. And within this, uh, uh, we estimate that uh, 15 to 30 percent did not explode. And uh, some could still explode today. So. All these uh, uh, ammunitions uh, were um, loaded uh, with um, poisons. Some uh, were uh, chemical weapons, so the poison was intestinal. Although it's only the, the explosive uh, matter which uh, is uh, poisonous. So it's also of interest to know where it's happening, if it's uh, going to groundwater and things like that. The landscapes, uh, especially in North France and in Belgium, were completely modified by the war. Here is a picture of a battlefield. I think it was uh, just the year after the war, so uh, 1918. So you see uh, the shelling had completely destroyed the, the, whole, uh, the whole landscape. Uh, and this is why uh, we still can find uh, uh, spores of, of that today. And most of these uh, areas are, not, are now covered with the uh, forest, uh, so that the best tool to, to see what's happening underneath the forest is, of course, LIDAR. And here is an example from, uh, from a German uh, researcher uh, who investigated uh, some uh, areas. So left, you have uh, the full image uh, with the forest cover. And uh, in the middle, you have the, the um, a digital uh, terrain model extracted from this data, where you can see, uh, in this case, uh, ammunition deposits. Another example, this is from uh, Belgium, uh, is a, an explosion field where um, unused, uh, unused uh, shells have been uh, made to explode uh, after the end of the war. So they just put them into the ground and explode them. Uh, and uh, it makes uh, so neat uh, craters. Uh, this is from a just general LIDAR survey, IRL survey with a one meter resolution. So even with this quite coarse resolution compared with what we do with the UAV, you can get uh, very interesting pictures. <coughs> 
So now uh, about the, the, the survey we, we performed uh, last year. So the main investigator uh, was Daniel Hubé from uh, BRGM, uh, which is a geoscience uh, institute uh, in France. And uh, L'Avion Jaune was a uh, mission to make the LiDAR and aerial survey. The area is Ardennes, so um, there were uh, terrible battles uh, known as the Battle of the Frontiers uh, in 1914, uh, with the uh, back and fro movements of uh, German, uh, French, Belgian and English uh, troops uh, over the front. These uh, areas have been uh, destroyed a lot. And here is our actual survey areas. So um, at the right, you can see uh, what the landscape is. It's relatively flat, uh, forest uh, nearly everywhere. And uh, we had defined two uh, survey areas, one which is uh, the larger, uh, 1.4 kilometer by 14, 400 meter, and the second, which is only about 30 hectares. So for that, uh, we used uh, two uh, survey sets. Uh, on the one side, uh, LiDAR uh, on UAV with a multicopter from Altigator and a yellow scan mapper. And on the other hand, uh, a manned plane with a usual camera, which is uh, our usual business at L'Avion Jaune, I would say. Uh, we decided uh, not to make the photographic survey from the UAV because the weather was too bad the days we, we flew uh, the LiDAR. So there was no light at all. It was uh, November or December, uh, very uh, cloudy weather. So it was uh, not feasible to make uh, a photographic survey. So we came back with the plane uh, one month later. So the yellow scan mapper we use is uh, the first uh, yellow scan instrument which has been uh, designed and built. Uh, it uh, makes uh, 18,500 shots per second, uh, has a 100 degree field of view, multi-echo and 100 meter range. 100 meter range uh, does not mean we will fly 100 meter because we have side beams. So. Uh, uh, the, the recommendation is to fly uh, under 80 meters. Uh, in this case, we decided to fly 50 meters uh, because we wanted uh, to penetrate and get uh, through the forest and get as much uh, ground points as possible. So it was a winter survey. So um, on. The main reason was uh, the trees lose their leaves in, in winter, uh, most of them. So um, we get a better result on, uh, on the ground in, in winter. The drawback was for photography with low light, uh, long shadows, and uh, not very nice colors because everything looks brown in this season. Uh, we have been flying uh, parallel lines uh, spaced uh, 50 meters from each other. Uh, unfortunately, we did not uh, respect the recommendation of R2 uh, to yesterday uh, of flying uh, a cross line. So we had uh, no uh, mean to really uh, uh, match the, the lines uh, together. But anyway, uh, this is only forest, so matching algorithm is also more difficult than if you have built areas. But 50% uh, overlap, on the one hand to ensure a, a good match, and on the other hand uh, also to maximize the, um, the density. So one return about uh, productivity of such a system. So we flew uh, the two areas, so 70 hectares uh, within one day. So this was uh, quite OK. Uh, in regard of the of the quite difficult uh, conditions, because the it was just the melting point, so some of the soil was frozen, other pieces were uh, uh, soggy, so it was really difficult to to get into the forest and to work there. We made uh, this kind of uh, survey line simply. 
so in the case of the second area, we also had the issue that the, um, uh, we were uh, in a configuration uh, with a, uh, a takeoff and landing point which was too far so that we could not do the, the whole area which was 1.5 kilometers. So we stopped at one kilometer uh, because uh, it was constrained by the French uh, UAV regulation. We could not go further than one kilometer away. So we had this constraint to, um, uh, to handle. The accuracy we observed uh, on was uh, quite okay. It was uh, about 15 centimeter on the raw data. And here uh, are some, uh, some results. So this is the, the area one with the cloud point uh, colorized by alti altitude. Uh, you can see that there is a very good uh, reconstruction of, the, of the, the floor, of the terrain. Uh, the same uh, with the trees removed, only the, DT, the shaded DTM. And here you can see that uh, interesting features appear. So this was not a surprise. This is a, um, a road which uh, still exists today. These are uh, former um, railways used to transport ammunition during uh, World War I. So this is the kind of things uh, which were looked for. And also there were some kind of small buildings here and some kind of um, uh, ways which uh, was uh, what the BRGM was looking for. Here a detail to, to see how, uh, how detailed the, the DTM is. We have about uh, 50 points per square meter. So it's a very accurate resolution and uh, allows to, to describe the microtopography and also to identify uh, uh, all the, um, the little features which were uh, traces of buildings from uh, one century ago. The second area uh, also has a point cloud uh, with the uh, altitude. Uh, here I made a cut to, to show you uh, what we see underneath the vegetation. Uh, here you have a, a wall, uh, a uh, earthen wall. Uh, here uh, again a trace of either a road or a um, railway. We couldn't identify it yet, but uh, you can uh, really uh, see everything what's happening under the, under the trees. So as a conclusion, uh, in terms of rendering, the data set was 100% satisfying. Uh, we could uh, depict all the, the feature we wanted to see. Um, some uh, already known features have been uh, confirmed and have been also mapped because uh, they, they knew it was here, but they don't have the uh, exact uh, location of it. And some new features have been detected, which need to be uh, confirmed uh, by uh, uh, in situ visits to see uh, what is it exactly and to interpret it. And of course, the, the additional benefit of this survey was uh, to have a cartographic reference uh, frame so that uh, the archaeologist can uh, put their founds on it and uh, locate it and help to make sense. Uh, last point, uh, so the, the sources. So uh, Daniel Hubé uh, wrote a book which uh, just came out uh, about um, the um, remainders of World War I, uh, especially uh, regarding uh, environment. Uh, I used many uh, 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 references uh, about World War I because I'm not a specialist at all. The, the field works were done by uh, L'Avion Jaune, Michael Juan, and also uh, an engineer from uh, Yellowscan. And uh, processing was done by Mario Ibrez. That's it.